It's Wednesday, June 14th. Just a few hours ago, Fed Chair Jay Powell came out, announced the Federal Reserve was not raising interest rates, but left the possibility open. And perhaps he implied that the Fed was going to hike them again in July. Uh, so it's not a skip, it's a pause. And so glad to have Daniel Demartino Booth, CEO and Chief Strategist of QI Research, here to break it down. Danielle, what do you think of the meeting? I mean, historic day, no, no hike, but is there one in July? Well, he, he was emphatic, right? Jack, we forget that before we really had live meetings at every meeting. And that was kind of when Bernanke rolled out a press conference following every FOMC. Before that, they had been more intermittent. Um, before that, we had a hard time as Fed insiders as, as, as to saying, gee, that's a live meeting. That's a lame duck meeting. So his use of the word live was very much Fed code. So when he said July is live, he's like, anything can happen, anything goes. But I mean, I, I think we have to back up here a little bit. If, and I have to emphasize this, if, if Powell succeeds in raising rates, he will rewrite modern monetary policy history. Because when the Fed typically pauses, that's, it's usually game over. Yeah. Things, are, things have come to an end. The, the trends that we've seen, whether it's in jobless claims or so many different measures of inflation coming down, uh, they suggest that it's time for a pause and a stop for that matter. But yet then came the dot plots. Oh, Jack, they were they were some dot plots to remember. And remember, he does not like dot plots, but boy, he was all over them today. They were, and we'll just, we can put that on screen today, uh, excuse me, right now. So it's a little bit of a messy chart, but the June dot plot on the right shows that now the median dot plot is at 5.6%, where uh, Federal Reserve, Federal Open Market Committee members think interest rates will be uh, for, for 2023. In March, they thought it would be 5.1%. So I think in uh, March, there were two... Uh, I think 11 members or 10 or 11 members who thought that interest rates would be at 5% or, or lower for mm -hmm. the lower range. And now it's just two. So the, the dot plot suggested that interest rates will be to use the phrase higher for longer. Certainly higher for longer. And if there's any way you can pop that chart back up on the screen, I want to point to two different parts of that June dot plot. The, 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 the big triangle, excuse me, the, the big rectangle on the right. There's a pyramid. There's a, there's a trio at the top of that. My venture is that Powell is the top dot and that, in other words, 100 basis points more of hiking this year. Right underneath him would be his two chief lieutenants, Christopher Waller, Federal Reserve Board, John Williams. They're the first Fed speakers to come out of the gate. I don't think that that is um, unchoreographed. I think that's very choreographed. And then you've got the two at the very bottom, and that would be Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed. And of course, Austin Goolsby yeah. of the Chicago Fed. Everybody else is in between. That's how, so it's like, you know, it, it's a spectrum on the dove to, to hawk spectrum. And mm -hmm. so that super high uh, dot for 2023 and 2024, was that Bullard? And I know that he became a non-voting member, right? Was he, was he a voting member in March? Um, he was not a voting member. He's not okay. been a voting member for all of 2023. And so if you're not a voting member, you don't get to have a dot? Is that the way? No, 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 no. Whether you're a voting member or not, you get a dot. Okay. Okay. So that is Bullard, but I, you know, it's not that his opinion doesn't it's, matter, but he's not voting. I think it's Jay Powell. Okay. Jack, I think the top dot is Jay Powell, believe it or not. It's his legacy and he speaks in measured tones, but how many times does a guy have to repeat the title of Paul Volcker's book over and over and over again? He will complete the task until the job is done. And it could be the case that Bullard is one of the top ones. And again, we'll wait and see what Williams and Waller say. But for me, at least, specifically because they're voters, their voices count right now. And especially because we've never seen a rate hiking campaign stop and then restart mm. in recent history. Now, I have a separate theory about why those plots, why those dots are so high. I, I want to hear that theory, but first I've, I've got to ask you, do you think if Jay Powell totally had complete control of the Fed and he could do whatever they want, you know, even though he does have a, a control now, he, you know, it is a process and he does have to play politics. Do, do you think that he would have raised interest rates today? Do you think that the skip or the pause 
of today, maybe hiking in July, is something to appease the doves? You know, it could be, but Jay Powell is closer to 70 than he is to 60 by a mile. So he knows his own Fed history and he knows how very um, unusual it would be for the Fed to come in and resume a rate hiking campaign after they've after they've paused. Um, I, I think it has more to do with with quantitative tightening, with shrinking the balance sheet, because as the, the two of us have discussed in the past, you cannot justify a form of tightening. Politico.com asked him the question about yeah. about shrinking the balance sheet. And he, he just brushed it off. He's like, no, 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 that's that's that other thing. That's going on in the background. Nary you ask about that question. Move along, move along. So you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. However you want to put it, he, the he just pushed him along. And that being said, you know, markets have begun to anticipate September, November, December. When's the Fed going to pull the plug on quantitative tightening? Well, my venture is that he said that he didn't anticipate any rate cuts for the next 12 months because he envisions the higher for longer backdrop in which to continue shrinking that balance sheet. I think that that's the takeaway from today. I think that your higher terminal rate should also reflect the, the synthetic tightening inherent in quantitative tightening, especially now that we don't have Treasury Secretary Yellen emptying out the, the nation's checking account and kind of glossing over, covering over the illiquidity effect of, of QT. Right. So there's the rate channel, how high interest rates are set by mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve. We talked about that at the beginning. Then there's the Fed's balance sheet, quantitative easing, expanding the balance sheet. Did that in 2020 and 2021 and a little bit 2022. And then quantitative tightening, uh, uh, reducing the balance sheet. Yep. And so the Federal Reserve has been doing quantitative tightening for a little bit over a, a year now, I think. And uh, 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 Victoria Guida of the uh, Politico asked, uh, are we approaching reserve scarcity? Is the banking system approaching reserve scarcity where the level of bank reserves uh, is going to be too low? Will treasury ish issuance impact that? Janet Yellen, treasury secretary, when she had the debt ceiling, they were running very low, not issuing treasuries because they, they were hitting that, 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 that uh, debt ceiling. And that sounds really bad and you can make a case it is, but it, it actually is good for liquidity because uh, there's a lot of more, if there's fewer, less collateral, there's more bank deposits, money, reserves, all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Whereas now this issue in some, you know, the politicians in, in DC have like solved the issue, but that means that there's you know close to a trillion dollars of treasury collateral that has to be issued and money has to absorb that. So that could be a liquidity drain. So uh, Victoria Guida of, of Politico asked those two questions and what did you make of Jay Powell's response? Well, that, that's, that's my droid comment. You know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. You need to move along. What, what's happening over here is agnostic to what's happening over here. Um, if there's this idea of, of, of the separation principle as it pertains to monetary policy, that, that the Fed can make monetary policy uh, for the good of financial stability, the banking system, but that they're going to make monetary policy separately as it pertains to inflation and getting it under control. Is there yet now a third parallel that he's trying to draw that says it doesn't matter what the, the U.S. Treasury Department is doing? That doesn't have anything to do with my QT. And that, I think, is, is how he communicated his response today, or at least I think that that's the message that he wanted to convey. And do you believe him saying that QT will continue to run on the background? Because you said, and you, you referenced a view that quantitative tightening might be over by the, you know, the time we hit uh, Halloween. No, no. I said that that's what, that, that's what the street has started banking on. Remember oh, okay, the last okay. time Jay Powell was forced to pull back and stop hiking interest rates. And he only got to two and a half percent, half of the, the tightening that he's accomplished this time around. But the last time around when he had to pull the plug, he had to pull every plug out of the wall, including yep. QT. Everything had to go, all forms of tightening. And for now, he is succeeding in continuing quantitative tightening while he pulls back on the lever of rate hikes, which, which he failed to do last time. Again, I really think he wants to succeed at this because he knows that an $8 trillion bloated balance sheet is simply too big to sustain in terms of the Treasury, the Fed's footprint in the treasury market, which became highly problematic in overnight trading in March of 2020, when for God's sake, you couldn't get a bid on the long bond. Right. So in, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, they said they were going to continue to raise rates. They didn't. And then did they stop quantitative tightening first and then cut rates? 
No, they, they announced that... that they, they announced that they were going to be pulling back on QT, ba- basically in concert with the market having a heart attack. Right. And this segued very quick because it was December 2018 mm-hmm. that he pushed through one last rate hike and markets went. Yep. So, but he had to pull all the plugs really at once. It was a very panicked move. And, and it, back then, the the uh, dot plots, I just was looking at it, forecasted like three more rate hikes into 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what's different about n- now that we also have more rate hikes on the dot plots last time, uh, Powell didn't deliver. He pivoted. What's different this time? Well, again, I think this time is his intent to continue delivering tightening in a synthetic form and you know, different people have done different math. There's a guy over at Barclays who's done some good math that shows that for every hundred billion dollars, of, of, of securities for every $100 billion, billion of shrinkage at the Fed's balance sheet, it equates to X number of basis points of, of rate hikes. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's where he's headed with this. But again, you cannot, you, you can't justify pulling the plug on quantitative tightening if you suggest that rate cuts are right around the corner. Excuse me. You cannot justify keeping quantitative tightening going yeah. if you acquiesce to what the press pool was desperate for him to acquiesce to today, which was, this is when I see the first rate cut. He's like, don't plan on it anytime soon. Yeah. What, what did he say exactly there? That was towards the end that I, I kind of missed that. So a lot of the conference was on when are the next hikes? Will there be next hikes? But there was a question about rate cuts. What exactly did he say? Can you paraphrase? I think he said several years. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's on Bloomberg.com. So yeah, he, he, he said that several years. That's a, it's a long time. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, Private it's, equity people and real estate people who uh, want, want it a lot sooner, as you know. It's a really long time. I mean, today the Fed paused and today Fifth Third pulled out of commercial real estate lending in total. Yep. So, I mean, the policy, the best way that I've had it explained to me is my buddy, Peter Bookfar. You've been to debrief dinners with Peter. The best explanation that I've had for the Fed maintaining high interest rates, just maintaining them, is that for any any property or company that has to come to the market to refinance. As far as they're concerned, the Fed has continued to raise rates if they have to go to market for two or three times what their borrowing costs were last time they borrowed. So it's the maintenance of high rates that makes all the difference in the world from the perspective of the borrower. Because if your interest costs are going to triple overnight, it doesn't matter what Jay Powell's doing. Your interest costs have still tripled overnight because he's maintaining high rates. Yes, it it doesn't matter if uh, interest rates are being held at five point five percent or five point two five percent. If the last time you refinanced, you you were borrowing at three percent, and now you know Fed funds plus three percent is is eight percent. That's a big ten percent. That's a big that's a big problem. Okay, Danielle, before we get into to the credit tightening and, and banking, commercial real estate, all the stuff you you follow, watch like a hawk. What about you? Earlier you said you had a theory watch for like why a hawk. The, now, G Jack, that was okay. Oh, 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 I didn't. You know, I, I can't help it. It was an accident. Uh, you had a theory of why the dot plot was so high. Tell us about that. So I think that the majority of the members of the Federal Open Market Committee agree with Jay Powell that shrinking the balance sheet is absolutely first and foremost uh, of import at the Fed. And they've had experience. Um, you have very few rookies on the board who didn't experience having to do a full 180 in 2018 and then having to tippy toe into not QE and then do full blown QE with the thank heavens the pandemic came because we have an excuse to launch full blown QE. I think a lot of the members of the committee are very cognizant of, of, of trying to maintain, trying to keep sustained Fed credibility here and reactive, violent policy that, that shreds at credibility. So mm-hmm. this, this aura of, of calm, we, we're all in this together. We know what we're doing. It's easy to say. I mean, we haven't had any bank failures in a while, right, Jack? Uh, yeah, six weeks, so long. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that banks' net interest margins are not being eviscerated. I mean, I cannot imagine what the second quarter earnings season is going to be like if you're seeing – lenders pull out of entire lines of business. Yeah, absolutely. So, so wait, sorry, why is the, why is the dot plot so high? Are you say- I think the dot plot is so high because everybody's on board with maintaining higher interest rates for longer. 
if you were going to signal, how would how would it be the only way for you, Jim Buller, to signal that you wanted to pull the plug on quantitative tightening when you're not a voting member? If, if you're Jim Bullard and you've all of a sudden woken up tomorrow, got a concussion, huge dove, and you wanted to signal at the FOMC, I think we should pull the plug on quantitative tightening, you would take your dot plot down. Yeah. You would say the Fed needs to be in an easing mode in the in the near term. Everybody's saying the Fed needs to stay in a tight in a tightening stance. And they're, I mean, except for the two, except for Daly and Goolsby, they're all there with at mm-hmm. least another. 50 basis points in 2023. Again, I don't think it's the level of rates. I think it's that they said it. So they're showing, not telling. They're saying, you don't believe higher for longer. Guess what? We just showed you higher for longer. Well, they showed them on the the piece of paper, the dot plot. But if they don't show it in uh, July, September, then they, you know, they wouldn't have, have delivered as well, right? So well, there's no dot out. plot in July, even though it's a live meeting. Yeah. Uh, there's no dot plot in July, uh, but it will be curious right. to see if by then, and again, the Fed took its unemployment rate projection from 4.4% to 4.1%. So they're, they're, they're communicating that they believe that the labor market has tightened. Yeah. Not as tight. It's tighter than it was. That's what they communicated by taking down their end of the year unemployment rate forecast, as well as taking up from 0.4% to 1% their 2023 GDP projection. Mm -hmm. So they're telling you, they're showing you, we think the economy is more resilient. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be less impacted by the lags of monetary policy than we thought was the case in the first quarter. And what do you think, Danielle? Has the US economy proved more resilient to interest rate hikes than expected? I mean, no one... Two years ago, would have thought the Fed would have been able to hike to five percent, and you know we'd, you know, inflation would, would we would still have inflation at, at all. Uh, what do you think? I think that there are two major factors that have been um, that have been something of a gigantic macro economic macroeconomic dis- distraction. The first is the nature of layoffs. If you're Joe Q working in Silicon Valley making $300,000 a year, you're not running out to the, to the California Department of Labor to apply for unemployment insurance. <clears throat> now, we're starting to see that. Continuing mm-hmm. claimants in the state of California, they're up 20% year over year compared to 18% for the nation as a whole. So you're finally starting to see that California is suffering more than the rest of the country. And let me repeat what I just said. For the country as a whole, Continuing claims, continuing weekly claims are up 18% year over year. 91% of the U.S. population lives in a state where continuing claims, the number of people collecting unemployment benefits. Initial claims just means you filled out the paperwork. Mm -hmm. A continuing claim means that you have been, that, that, that you qualify and that you've been given unemployment benefits. So one's a much clearer prison than the other. Where that's headed tells me that we might go past what their unemployment rate projection is going to be. But the white collar nature of the recession, Citigroup just announced it was going to, going to let go of 1,600 uh, employees. Are they going to be running to the New York Department of Labor and filling out unemployment insurance claims immediately? Or have they set aside hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in a rainy day fund just in case this ever happened? And they're going to go park themselves in the Hamptons for the rest of the summer and not bother applying for an, as an initial jobless claimant. So the white collar nature of the, of, of the recession has slowed the feed through to, a, to the unemployment rate rising. Yes. And anecdotally, you and I both know that it's very hard right now to, uh, in, in the labor market for technology uh, and finance you know, and, and crypto. And so, but, but isn't finance and tech a relatively small percentage of the labor market and you know, I think something like four percent of the labor market in the U.S. is is information technology. I thought it would be way higher. Yes, they have a disproportionate percentage of the earnings, but yes. you know, for most people are not impacted by that. So I mean, you could have fifty percent layoffs in, in uh, technology, and, and VC is just like decimated. And you know, that's only two hundred basis points for the un- only two hundred basis points for the unemployment rate. That is correct, and that's also why we're not seeing anything violent. But Indeed.com recently came out and said, based on what we're seeing, the lowest paid employees are where we're seeing job openings disappear the most quickly. 
Really? They're going to be the ones dragging down wages going forward. This is when the real teeth of the recession set in. They said that based on their current trajectories, that they they anticipate wage inflation year over year to be to, be to 3.1% at the end of 2023. I mean, Indeed.com, they've got a prism into the entire workforce and a real time one at that. That's that's There's a new outfit also called Link Up. Ten, I think 10,000 companies that they track, their job openings as well. 84% of industries, 84% of professions have seen dramatic declines in job openings over the last year. This is very fresh data, but it's also telling you that now we're going to continue seeing the rising momentum that we've seen in jobless claims, that the rise from 3.4% to 3.7% is not necessarily going to be an aberration, but we're going to continue to see the unemployment unemployment rate rise now that we're seeing lower paid workers in the in the crosshairs of, of layoffs going forward. That's one thing. The white collar nature of the recession has delayed the impact on the labor market. The the late fiscal relief finally turning down. It wasn't until a few months ago that President Biden pulled the plug on food stamps and Medicaid extra emergency funding, forcing, by the way. We, we saw record levels of the labor force participation rate among women in May's data. It's forced moms back into the labor force because they don't have this supplement to their grocery budget anymore that was able to let one of the two spouses stay out of the labor force. So we saw that big spike in May. The second thing is something I've written about extensively. That, that's the employee retention credit. And the employee retention credit has pumped $205 billion into the U.S. economy, mostly into the hands of wealthy people since it was rolled out with the U.S. CARES Act. Uh, in, in the month of April, IRS data tells us it was $20.7 billion. So there is still a very real form of fiscal stimulus that is supporting spending in America. It's in the hands of very few. And that's why we're seeing that you know, an overabundance, more than two thirds of Americans feel that we're in recession in the most recent polling. But those who spend the most money, the top quintile of earners, top 20% of earners is responsible for more than 40% of consumption in America. They're the ones who are still getting their pockets lined by Uncle Sam. And now the IRS has had to open up investigations because now there's calls of wide, widespread fraud hitting this program. Of course there are. If, if you had needed the employee retention credit when it was first rolled out with the CARES Act because your business was disrupted because of COVID, you would have long since either A, gone out of business or B, gotten the credit. So, Danielle, the, the, the portrait as you see it, the labor market, it, it's quite dire or, or at least getting there. I, I guess, yeah, just like, are, are you surprised that the unemployment rate is at 3.7% given you said all the reasons you just laid out for why it's so lagging. But I mean, you know, everyone knows that the labor market unemployment rate is lagging, but is it this lagging that it's the unemployment rate is at 3.7% and things are you know as, as bad as you say? Well, I mean, again, we have to bear in mind that certain metrics have not fully recovered from when the pandemic hit. We always talk about the labor force participation rate. Very few of us talk about the employment to population ratio, what percentage of Americans are actually in the workforce off of which you gauge the unemployment rate. We mm -hmm. still have millions of people who are capable of working but are not working. They're still sidelined. You have a, you have a steady rise in, in, in working age people north of 55 years old who are coming back into the workforce. They're finding that the Social Security payments that they took early are not enough to pay for the fact that their rent is still, even though even though rents have started to come down, that doesn't make them any lower than they were in 2019. So we are seeing um, signs of people coming back into the workforce. The whole quiet quitting thing has gone bye bye, and that's yeah, yet oh. another anecdotal sign that it, it, people are. That there was an article on the Bloomberg Terminal that that you know people are fighting for their for their rights to be workers, and I'm like, fight on. And I'm not trying to be glib. But at this point, if companies are in, are in a cost-cutting mode and people refuse to come back to the office, they're like, awesome. I don't have to pay you severance either. Bye. Yeah. And tell us also about Chapter 11 filings for, for bankruptcies. Oh, another 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 grim you know, piece of economic data that, that you're tracking. And then how do you square all of this economic you know, uh, sort of gloom that you see with an absolutely uh, on-fire stock market, you know, NASDAQ 100, up something like 40% year-to-date? Mm -hmm. So I'll take the second question second. Um, chapter 11 bankruptcies, according to Epic, EPIQ are up 105% year over year. Uh, that's May data. 
Um, large bankruptcies as tracked by Bloomberg, meaning 50 million or more in liabilities. Um, we've had a few more this week. They're running at the fastest pace since 2009. Um, but a lot of Chapter 11 smaller companies, uh, let me ask you a rhetorical question. You're, you're Joe Q, Jack Farley, you've got JF, LLC, shingle hanging outside, and you decide that your company's belly up, it's just not going to survive, whatever the economic contraction is. Are you going to file an unemployment claim against yourself? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. And what we're seeing, especially in dailyjobcuts.com, is a continued parade of smaller business closings that won't show up in the data. It's just a lot of these companies don't even have the money to, to file Chapter 11, to hire a bankruptcy attorney to take them through the process. A lot of them actually, from what I've been hearing on, on the street, they actually pay off their creditors slowly, even though they're out of business. They continue to pay down their creditors because they know that one day they're going to come back in and form another company. But mm. we're not seeing a lot of the job destruction because there's no place to raise your hand. Um, we will see it. We will see it once the Bureau of Labor Statistics finally pulls their head out of the sand and, um, and recognizes that with bankruptcies running at the fastest pace since 2009, it might not make much sense that 37% of all non-farm payroll job creation in the last 12 months has come from the birth of new companies. And I just let's jump in there before we talk about the stock market. How many of these bankruptcies are, let's, I'm just going to paint a picture, a Silicon Valley company that had kind of a pie in the sky idea, raised a ton of money in 2020, 2021, whether it's from VC or you know, fr friends, families and, and stuff like that. And the, the investors subsidizing the losses stopped because the, the funding spigot stopped and they just, the business model didn't work out and they had to declare bankruptcy. How, how, what's that versus the, when you and Mike Green talk about, you know, Uber drivers filing and starting their own LLCs so that they can get tax breaks. And if they don't get those tax breaks, I mean, their earnings are very, very small as, as you've, you've talked about. Uh, so in that sort of spectrum, what is, what's the kind of characterization of the, the companies that are filing for bankruptcy? So I, I think that, um, I think that what's interesting in the, in the Epic data is that they have a separate line item where they follow small business bankruptcies. So these are actually people who've, who've gone, gone through the court system. And those are up even more compared to Chapter 11 as a whole. It's a subsector, if you will. But I do think, and you know, there was a big Wall Street Journal story over the weekend, startups calling it quits. Uh, I, I do think that a lot of what we're seeing is funny money, too much money being thrown at a lot of startups that they've simply had the, 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 the plug pulled on them. I think that's a lot of what we're seeing. Why is the stock market so darn high? Hmm. Yeah. Well, so this is more of a Mike Green question than this is a Danielle question, but I have been fascinated to learn that there is the downside of the white collar recession, which is the, the beginnings of redemptions uh, at 401k plans and the vanguards of the world starting to see that inflows into 401ks are being impaired because the people who are losing their jobs, who are not necessarily filing for unemployment insurance, they're also not putting money into a 401k plan because they're no longer getting a paycheck, mm -hmm. nor is the company matching that contribution to their 401k plan. So larger money, larger trades, if Mike Green explained this to me correctly, they're farther and fewer between. We are seeing good evidence that smaller trades, smaller funds, and retail investors are whipsawing this market about based on the idea, if you go on anybody's Twitter feed, that we're in the middle of a melt-up. Yeah. Now, my good friend Brent Donnelly uh, mm. drew a very nice parallel picture a few days ago and said, you know, the last hurrah of the NASDAQ boom looked like this, felt like this. The difference between then and now is that now is really drawn out. And it's taken much longer for this to happen. But he said the pattern is pretty much identical, that we're kind of in this last hurrah before the bottom falls out. Got it. Tell us about what you're seeing, other economic indicators you've been tracking, uh, offices, cars, mm -hmm. and, and bank loans. I guess let's just start with offices and commercial real estate. It's, it's a train wreck. I mean, it's just, it's... Uh, there are all kinds of, I tell you what, 
you know how Office is doing based on how many reports are rolled out reassuring you that Office is going to be fine on Bubble Vision. What's Bubble Vision? Sorry to interrupt. Wanted to let you know about BlockWorks' upcoming crypto event, Permissionless 2. This ultimate DeFi gathering will be taking place in Austin on the 11th to the 13th of September 2023. It will feature the very best discussions on ZK tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, and much, much more. All the big hitters in crypto are going to be there. So if you're into crypto, you need to be there too. To get a 20% discount to a full three-day pass to Permissionless 2, click the link in the description and use code GUIDANCE20. That's GUIDANCE20. Thanks. Let's get back to the episode. Any of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, they're, they're all Bloomberg, Bloomberg TV. They're all rolling out experts that say this is being highly exaggerated. And I'm like, oh, yeah. really? So we're supposed to celebrate that New York offices are now 50% occupied in the largest office, office market effects. on the planet. 50% is up from 40%. Hey, 50 is the new, new 100. Yeah. Um, there is something to be said for AI, for jobs being replaced by AI, for the fact that AI does not occupy a, a cubicle. Uh, we mentioned before, uh, a lot of companies are taking the opportunity of people who refuse to come back into the office to just fire them. Um, I, I think office is going to be impaired for a generation. I really do. Um, and that's saying something, but my home base of Dallas, Texas has the highest um, office vacancy rate in the country. It also happens to have seven massive office skyscrapers going up on the hot side of the highway. It's just going to add exponentially to this office vacancy, to this glut. Working through gluts is really, really difficult when you come to a secular turning point for any, for any sector. And what we're seeing now with AI is that a lot of these cubicles are going to forever be unoccupied. And you can only convert so many of these buildings. Yeah, and I, I don't know, but I've heard in New York City, office commercial real estate is so expensive that, oh, we'll just convert it to residential doesn't work because it, it trades at a premium. And you can't look, you, offices, the, the best way a developer once explained this to me was apartment buildings have, have plumbing lines that go up in several silos throughout the building. Offices have one right up the middle. Because that's where you get out of the elevator bank and there's the restroom. They have one set of plumbing. It's extremely expensive to retrofit an office building to be a hotel or, or multifamily residential. Very expensive. Uh, you're so right. Absolutely. And my point was even not accounting for what you just said, uh, premium office in, in New York City, a you know, very expensive uh, office market, it, you know, is like three times what a rental would think. So even if even if what you said wasn't true and you could snap your fingers and convert it into this beautiful office building, yep. it still wouldn't it still wouldn't be. Uh, if I was Mr. Plumber, you know. <laughs> All right, so uh, Danielle, there's this narrative. Yeah, I mean, I, you disperse. Tell us what's narratives of the different companies that are that are pulling out. Uh, you know, different funds that want to sell their stuff. There's a narrative that okay, office it has its problems, COVID, AI, secular uh, decline. But multifamily is strong. The rental market is strong. You know, rents are going up ten percent year over year. And yes, your, your your borrowing costs have gone up, but multifamily is strong. What do you say to that? I think multifamily construction's rocking it. <laughs> you've got more units coming online in the next eighteen months than you've had since either of us have been born. It's it's extraordinary the supply that's coming online. And there was a very good front page article on the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago talking about renters are now getting the upper hand over landlords finally. And it has to do with the fact that that last year at this time, we would have been talking about new apartment leases being up double digits year over year. That's no longer the case. New apartment buildings know that they're competing for existing tenants. It's existing leases. It's renewing leases that are seeing the highest double digit rate of rental increases. Let me tell you how many times that works once. That works once. And once you get all this new supply online, people will get up. It's very expensive to move. It's a pain in the ass. I get all of that. But if the rental differential is big enough, there's either going to be concessions on the part of the landlord or they're just going to get up and leave. All right. And how does that play out into inflation, given that you know, rent is such an input into uh, in inflation? So it's interesting. Truflation today was down to 2.54% led by housing. And 
housing coming down as quickly as it ha- as it is, rentals coming down as quickly as Redfin just announced uh, that, that rentals are falling at the fastest pace in years. Uh, so you are seeing it play out. The fact that that New York City alone accounts for 11 percent of the shelter component of the CPI. New York City? New York, well, the state of New York. New York, okay, so yeah, I got it. It's basically New York. There's not exactly skyscrapers all over. As as many New Yorkers, I'm so self-obsessed. Whenever I hear New York, I think, oh, you're talking about me. It's not just Manhattan, but but the state of New York accounts for 11% of the shelter input of the CPI. So the fact that New York has finally come back with a huge lag compared to the rest of the nation in terms of its apartment rentals going up means that it's dragging its way through the CPI. But we have seen, I think, the peak in shelter inflation, and we will see that start to come off. Again, Citigroup just announced 1,600 people today, bankers going. Um, Perella Weinberg, I want to say, they announced layoffs again today as, as well. So it's coming. And But because of the lag effect of New York alone, we've seen that stickiness in the shelter component of the CPI. Same goes for Mannheim. Mannheim flows through to the CPI with a two-month lag. Used car price inflation was responsible for 34% of the core month-over-month increase in core CPI last month, 34%. And Mannheim is telling us that used car prices are falling and they're falling fast. We'll see that in the next few months of the CPI report, but it flows through with a two-month lag. Right. But that's because used prices, car prices did go back up in, what was it, February? February, February. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's... But it's coming through with a two-month lag. That's the way Mannheim works in, in, in terms of when it manifests in the CPI is two months later. Got it. So, Danielle, based on the economic paint picture that you're painting of scler- sclerotic growth, maybe very low growth, and uh, inflation will drop like a rock, it seems like not only should the Fed not hike more, they maybe should be cutting. Uh, so if you were you know, if, uh, running the Fed, would you be cutting? And if this is accurate, why is the Federal Reserve hiking? Or continuing to hike, even though they didn't hike today, but they're going to, you know, they may hike in July. So, Jack, this goes back to the philosophical discussions that the two of us have had over the last 12 months. And you actually pegged it a few minutes ago when you said, gee, private equity can't wait two more years. Mm-hmm. It's the point has not changed. It really hasn't. And to see public pensions begin to be able to push back against, you know, being held at gunpoint extortion. If you don't invest in this next great, big, gigantic $20 billion fund, you're not going to be allowed to come into the next one if you're the state of whatever public pension, um, I I think we're not at the point of marking to market. We're still marking to target. And the Fed's footprint in the treasury market remains too big. So it's not that they shouldn't be easing policy. It's not that they shouldn't be cutting rates. It's not that they should be continuing to do quantitative tightening. It's that quantitative easing got them in a position that's become untenable, where they have the, the, the worst of two choices to make. Do we continue shrinking the balance sheet because we need treasury market functionality? Mm-hmm. We have to have, it's, it's, it's a matter of, 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 our, of our national sovereignty for heaven's sake. And Jay Powell recognizes that. The pragmatist in Jay Powell knows that in March of 2020, that there was no bid on the long bond in Asia overnight. And that's not acceptable for the risk-free asset of planet earth. Mm-hmm. So, but it's also untenable unless the Fed's footprint shrinks and it's not forced into raising its, its continuing to grow its balance sheet. I think the best of all worlds for Jay Powell would be if he could eventually stop lowering interest rates at 2% and leave the balance sheet alone forever. So in other words, not necessarily continue to shrink it once you hit ample reserve regime, stop, but recognize with any hope that it that growing the Fed's balance sheet going forward is a broken tool that never should have been added to the toolbox. What, what would that be? Uh, Eight trillion, seven trillion on the balance sheet? Because it's tough. To, to I mean, you're, we're not getting back to zero. The, the quantitative tightening that has been so rough. Uh, it's if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, it's a very, very slow decline. And the New York Fed came out with a, uh, with, a, with a report in April that suggested that by the end of 2025, that the balance sheet could be at six trillion dollars. <laughs> Wake me up if we actually get there, but maybe seven's feasible, Mm -hmm. maybe, and maybe seven trillion and stopping is feasible and just potentially, you know, allowing for some very mild natural runoff, especially on the mortgage backed security side, you know, maybe you barbell it up backwards 
maybe as mortgage prepayments start to come through in a falling interest rate environment, the Fed slows the rolling off of treasuries and increases the natural runoff of mortgage-backed securities and thereby shrinks its balance sheet. I mean, let's think outside the box here. They haven't been able to roll off the mortgage-backed securities that they wanted to because prepayments yeah. slowed so much. People are married to their 2.5% 30-year fix. I guess as they should be. As they, as they should be. But death, divorce, and taxes, there are things, and lo- the loss of jobs. You know, 63% of Americans who bought a home in 2022 and 2023 are saying they can't make their, their, their house payments. Mm-hmm. So buying in at the top of a market's not working out very well either, especially if it's a two income household and one of you loses the job and forget it if it's a one income household and you've got a mortgage that you can't afford, regardless of what the mortgage rate is. So I, your point, I don't think you've said it at this point, but your point about Jay Powell wants to kill the Fed puts and whenever you know uh, shit hits the fan, they don't want to do tons of quantities. They don't want to drop interest rates at zero to, to sort of be the savior. And the true beneficiaries of that are you know, very wealthy investors in you know, hedge funds, real estate, stocks, mm-hmm. everything. If that is the case, why not just keep interest rates at 5.25%? Why, why do you want to poke the bear if the economy is so bad? Uh, because you know, if we go to five, we go to 6% and you know, all these, uh, grim things that, are, that you haven't really released into the data yet, but, but, but that you've been tracking released in the data, then the Fed might have to actually cut the interest rates to zero. I don't think, Jack, the Fed ever had to go to zero in the first place. And I think that that's the hard lesson that, that I'm not going to be patronizing here, but somebody your age wouldn't remember. Yeah, yeah. 2% used to be crazy. Uh, 2% used to be half of normal. 4% used to be normal. So um, neutral. So I, I think that, that given he, was, he had the latitude to lower by 250 basis points uh, in 2019, and when the pandemic hit, to go to, to go, going to the zero bound was 250 basis points of easing. Well, to get to two, 2% Fed funds rate, you've got 300 basis points of easing. Maybe you're cutting off credit to the worst creditors Maybe those companies are still going to go out of business. You might take some zombies down along the way. Oh, gee, sorry. Um, But you're actually bolstering the long-term health of corporate America and the U.S. economy. So I agree with you. And uh, Edward Chancellor's new book, Price of Time, he quotes Walter Badgett uh, makes saying like, if there's one thing John Bull can't stand, it's 2%. John Bull being the stand in like John Smith. Yep. Uh, and, and that being when interest rates go to 2%, pe- people, people go, go crazy and they, they do all sorts of things. They invest in, you know, the sovereign debt of countries that don't exist. So all that, you know, bubbles, we, we, we're familiar with that having seen 2020, 2021. Um, so I get that argument. And uh, when the Fed cuts, it doesn't want, it shouldn't cut to zero. That causes all sorts of problems. Uh, it should cut to 3% or some, some type of higher level, a higher floor. Sure. But why, if the economy is bad, as you say, why would the Federal Reserve continue to hike? Uh, in July and and September, I don't think they're I don't think they are hiking, Jack. I don't think they're raising interest rates again in this cycle. I think the cycle, I think the rate cycle has ended. Okay, okay, so th- thank you. Sorry, I, I was I was unclear about your views. Okay, so you think they just want to? That is their way. The dot plot, the hawkish dot plot. That's their way of letting the market know that quantitative tightening will continue. But the the rates, you actually okay. So you do. Okay. And they see rates as being higher, but again, academic studies, studies done by sell-side firms, they've all shown that quantitative tightening is its own synthetic form of a rate hike. Yeah. And again- And, and credit tightening, which is Jay Powell has said. A bunch of bureaucrats up in Washington, D.C. at the federal market, they're not as nuanced as that. Is, is Jay Powell in his thinking? Probably. Probably. And he knows he has to have higher for longer to keep shrinking the balance sheet. Got it. But- High for longer, not higher for longer. Because if there are no high, 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 high for longer, yes, high high. For longer. yeah, it's it's higher for any company trying to refinance. It's a hell of a lot higher. Got it. So, so there are those in the market who think uh, that oh, actually the Fed will do more hikes and that higher for longer. So you're not in that camp, and I'm glad that uh, you you made that clear. No, I'm I'm in the camp of high for longer just because I've never, I I don't see it in the data. I don't see anything in the yeah. data that shows a reacceleration of of the real economy. I don't see that. 
And I think that you would have to see a reacceleration in the economy to justify a further rate hike from here. That's typically not how recessions play out. Yeah. And as we know, there are some banks that just cannot handle more rate hikes. I'm not saying the bank system will collapse. You know, all the, many, many s- sound banks that could handle interest rates being whatever, but some of them uh, need cuts. And I, I did an interview with Randy Woodward, who you know, big fan of mm-hmm. yours, as, and uh, John Tuhig, who trades loans. And he said, so many bank loan officers, they're making loans, and the treasurer, CFO, is allowing them to make loans, approving the loans, because they think the Fed is going to cut rates. Cut rates, not just not hike, but cut rates. Yeah, um, get back to me on that. I just... <sighs> I mean, but the thing is, Jack, either they're doing that or they're pulling their lines of business. Yep. As you, as you said with the fifth third today. They're not really they're not really finding a, a gray area or citizens, I think, pulled their auto lines of credit yep. last week. So they're, they're either doing A or B. It's a very binary outcome. Either you're you're going here come Fed rate cuts or you're saying wake me up when monetary policy is normalized and we can step back into this business for now prior to student loan repayments kicking in, I can't assess what credit's going to be in a world after whatever, whatever post August the 29th, it looks like I can't figure that out. So I'm just going to push pause on this business line and just exit for now. Got it. Final question for you, Danielle is I did an interview with uh, Robert Kaplan on Monday, f- uh, former president of the Dallas Fed, where you used to work. Uh, um, he actually followed me on Tuesday. Uh, on Twitter? Yeah, I followed uh, him back. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so I uh, was very happy with the interview. He said some things. He said the Fed monetized the debt in March 2020, which we you know, we all kind of know, but the Federal Reserve and uh, you know, a lot of folks in the media do not actually say. It's one of those things you're not supposed to say. So it's I all, say it all, all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, oh, you, you do. And that's, what, that's why we like you. But I did get some pushback saying, Jack, you did not ask him about uh, the trading scandal that he, uh, and I knew this going into the interview that he owned large and was trading large uh, individual stocks. I knew that, but I, did, I only realized after that he actually was doing S&P 500 futures as well. So I think I've heard you before opine on this a little bit. Can you sort of uh, appease the part of my audience that's mad at me for not asking him about this? And uh, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this? So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a very, Jack, let me put, let me put it this way. I'll, yeah. I'll make some enemies with you. I wouldn't have asked him about it either um, because that would have made you just outright rude in, in my view. He's had his reputation tarnished. Uh, when I had class one clearance working at the bank where he worked, I could have no sooner traded individual securities than a man in the moon. I had to sign off on the same documents that presumably he did not have to sign off on that said only third parties, never individuals, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, no banks. SPY, VOO. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff. All that stuff. So, but I think, uh, I think if he's going to come out at the other end with his reputation tarnished, but still a voice of of hawkishness when he was there it's very few who come out and use the word monetize yeah they and want- he did that dissent in against the flexible average inflation targeting sorry he did he dissented in the september 2020 fomc oh, he against was, he knew it was bullshit he knew it was the worst yeah. thing that the fed could have ever done it's like let's just say we can average it for a little while and then why don't we monetize seven trillion dollars of debt create inflation and then say we're gonna let this puppy run worst decisions of all time good for him for dissenting so I'm not going to take away from his achievements. No, 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 no on his individual traits. That was something that was never allowed when I was at the Fed. And it's something that he should have had better judgment than to have undertaken, despite the fact that he was a former Goldman guy, successful in his own right, wealthy, et cetera. Nobody's ever above the rules. And unless they change the rules expressly for him, that was certainly not what it was when I was there. And if Kaplan is watching this, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I said that Eric Rosengren was dealing in much, much, much smaller dollar amounts and <clears throat> certainly not with individual names at the time. He was the top cop within the Fed. He was the preeminent internal expert on commercial real estate, and he was first in line to be head of banking supervision and regulation. And let me tell you, we wouldn't have the commercial real estate situation on our hands that we do today 
if Rosengren had stayed in Boston and been elevated to that vice chair position because he knew how concentrated banks were in their commercial real estate portfolios and he would have raised the red flag sooner. That was his bailiwick and, and he was a real loss, not to the Boston Fed necessarily, but to the financial system given all we talk about day and night is commercial real estate. And mm -hmm. he was the internal expert and he had been he had been raising the red flag for years himself saying we really do need to look more closely at banks that are getting too knee deep into this one line of business. Uh, but and what about Bostick? Bostick, he, is he he's still there, correct? But he had some sort of thing with the trade. Yeah, right? you know, I didn't look too deeply into it because it sounded like an honest mistake or it sounded like he didn't understand the rules or didn't convey the rules to his financial advisor. I, I didn't look too far into that one in, in particular. Um, Clarida stunk to high heaven. Powell, oh. he would never have been hired as an insider trader. He lost so much money trading when he wasn't supposed to. So that, that was clearly inadvertent on his part, despite, despite the fact that he has tons of money. Clarida stunk to high heaven. Tell us about that. Oh, Clarida's trades were just, it, it, it's a matter of public record, Jack. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stir the pot, but, but the, the types of trades that he was doing at the time were very much um, exploiting monetary policy. That, that was, it, it was very insider trading feeling. And he just got a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Yeah. And it should be said, um, if you're a, con a member of Congress and you vote to uh, spend all this money on some plane, and then you buy call options on Raytheon, that's your edge. Whereas as is Federal Reserve, you don't really have an edge on single stocks, but it's on monetary policy. So for example, if someone mortgage uh, mortgage real estate investment trusts, where they buy mortgage backed securities, which are bought by the Fed, and then they use, they borrow at interest rates for seven, that is like, oh, they have a lot of- up by a third of the market. Why don't I get into the bottom floor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. Well, uh, you, I know you have to go. Thanks for for shedding some some light on on that. Uh, you have any closing thoughts? I think we I think we should be highly cognizant of where households are in this delinquency cycle before student loan repayments begin. Yeah, yeah. So this is it, it, people don't want to talk about it or think about it because it's been three and a half years, and really, it can't be that bad. I don't know. The, the studies that have come out that have shown that, that a lot of these borrowers went along in their lives, assuming that they would never have to pay it back and took on additional debt. A lot of them are the same people who who were part of the exodus, the exurbs, and now they have a mortgage they can't handle and an auto payment they can't handle. Now they're about to get slapped with having to pay their student loans again. So we have to pay attention to the potential outside of the employee retention credit and the, the, the skids, it keeps greasing, thanks to the U.S. taxpayer. IRS, please hear me now. Please open an investigation. Shut this program down. Uh, but I think we have to be cognizant to the idea of after Labor Day, a lot of U.S. households kind of having a budgetary heart attack. Final question. What did you think about Powell's mood? He seemed maybe a little less spirited to me in, than in previous meetings, or is that, is that not fair? So the reason that I said that Powell was the top dot this time, as opposed to Bullard, um, is because you do get the sense that he's a man on an island right now. He knows that he's the one being identified as, as he, he's the bad guy, just like Volcker was the bad guy. I mean, the I can- board, The Fed board, even though the Fed board is, FOMC board is tight, they're not as tight as him. They're not as targeted as he is. Yeah. He's, he's the the, in your mind, in your, how, the way you see it, Danielle, he's a man on a mission. He's a man on a mission and he's a man on a mission that's going to hurt people. And- to his credit, there's no reason to be sitting up at the podium barking like a seal happy um, about the Fed's accomplishments. And what he's doing right now in trying to finish the job, knowing that that's going to cause people to lose their jobs, it's just, it, it's, it can't be easy. It can't be easy for any man. P many people vilify him. I, I don't. I think that he wants to break the stranglehold of the Fed put, and it's a very difficult job and he'll probably fail at it. But if he can succeed, in maintaining the shrinkage of the balance sheet and never go back to the zero bound. And if that's his legacy and we get rid of those two ZERP and QE, if we throw them out of the toolbox forever, to me, that's one hell of a legacy. Good for him. On that note, we'll leave it. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. Folks can uh, follow your work on Twitter at Demartino Booth. And of course, they've got to check out uh, QI Research. Danielle, just quickly tell us a little bit about, there's the, there's the Daily Feather and then there's the Institutional Note. What's the, the difference between those two products? So the Daily Feather is it's, it, every trading day of, of the year, which means I have Sunday off. Woo 
um, coming into Juneteenth, but uh, it's I'm told that it's an institutional caliber product that's at a retail price. So we publish, we, we try and dig deep into um, the, the data, the financial markets and, and do what other firms don't do. Try and go through things, whether it's proprietary indicators or through different prisms or by digging one, ma- p- pulling one more layer off the onion. And that's our daily offering. And we keep it extremely reasonable for a reason so that anybody and everybody can have access to it. And then we publish 13 times a week for our institutional clients. Um, they've, got, they've got access to my private Twitter feed. Um, we've got not, 13, our- not, not 13 times a week, 13 13- 13 separate, the quick quill, quick quill. We publish the quick quill every day, every, every morning and then the feather every day. And then we oh, publish, oh, in total 13 times a week. We yeah, publish yeah, yeah. on Sundays and we publish on Saturdays. We publish a lot and the weekly. Yeah. You so are yeah. prolific, Danielle. Yeah. You, yeah you, yes. Well, that's why. But who needs sleep? I feel bad for your keyboards, Danielle. I'll put it that yeah, way. Well, they do have to be replaced with good frequency. Truly. <laughs> I go into Apple and they're like, who can do this? And I'm like, I can. Um, but uh, but anyways, our, our institutional offering, it's got a, its own dashboard, our own Bloomberg chat room. It, it, it's growing and we've got a great client community. So if you're running money, if you're running a family office, that's certainly something for you to look into um, at, at QI Research. And if you want to give the feather a try, demartinobooth.substack.com. I can attest to the quality of both products. I've, I've read and enjoyed both. And uh, what was I going to say? Oh, you, you Daniel, you will be back uh, later this month. Uh, uh, to, to, share, to share your updates. I'm looking forward to, to, to picking your, your brain in, in a week or two. Thanks again, and thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.